You are listening to Shout for Libraries in Edmonton on CJSR. We're a group of library students at the University of Alberta who are interested in raising awareness about topics such as censorship, freedom of expression, and social responsibility. My name is Marin. I'm Michelle. And I'm Larissa. And we'll be your hosts for this half an hour of library-centric radio. Thanks for tuning in. On each episode of Shout for Libraries, we explore a different issue in library and information studies. This episode, we will be discussing Indigenous storytelling. Stories are key to librarianship. After all, part of what we are is a house for stories, both digital and print. Not to mention, with all of the programming libraries do, there are plenty of people making new stories every day in the library space. Of course, the stories that are in the library are subject to cataloging, and defining what a story is can be pretty tricky depending on the catalog systems you are using. Show for Libraries' own Chris Joseph talked to Sheila LaRock and Kayla Larson from the University of Alberta Libraries, who are working on a project about how we categorize the stories and materials that we keep. My name is Sheila LaRock. I am originally from Saskatoon. I'm Métis. I did my undergrad at the U of S, went to Toronto for library school, and now I am here in Edmonton working on the Decolonizing Description Project at the University of Alberta. My name is Kayla Larson, and I'm a second year School of Library and Information Studies student. I'm also an Indigenous intern with Rutherford Library. Uh, My connection to the Decolonizing Description Working Group is I was brought in kind of at the beginning of the group to do community connections, on-campus engagement, and working with students, staff, and faculty uh, kind of on their thoughts about the project. So Kayla, you are a a young library and archives professional, but most of our audience is not sort of from that realm. How would you basically describe the typical experience of an Indigenous person who goes to the library, maybe for the first time, because they want to learn about themselves or their own culture? So I think a lot of Indigenous people, not all, but a lot, they definitely feel uncomfortable sometimes the first time when they go into an archive or an academic library. They're institutions that are not really or never were really for Indigenous people. They are colonial institutions. And I feel like a lot of Indigenous people, when they do access uh, these institutions, they often feel like they aren't welcomed. Sheila? We as professionals take it as a for granted thing that people know how to do research and they know how to, how to access these um, information systems, but it's It's simply not the case. And there's an additional layer when you're Indigenous where knowing that institutions are not meant for you and feeling that, like, this is a space where you don't belong. When I say the word librarian, there's there's an image that comes to your mind and it might not necessarily look like you if you are an Indigenous person. Sometimes patrons are not so welcoming of Indigenous people in the libraries, especially academic libraries and archives. And... There's a lot of access to information issues for individuals who are not academics, research professionals, etc. So when it comes to the decolonizing descriptions project, even to a librarian that sounds sort of daunting, but what do we mean in terms of um, the experience of an Indigenous person seeking knowledge? Uh, like what, is, what is the project about? Sheila? So basically there are a few different library um, classification schemes and metadata, which is data about data, things that we use in libraries to make information retrievable. So one of those things that we do is assign subject headings, and currently within the Library of Congress system, the subject heading for Indigenous people is Indians of North America. That's the overall heading, and then it delineates from there. So uh, if you are Indigenous and aren't, Um, identifying as an Indian of North America and what does this North America mean even, let alone who are these Indians, Uh, even though that's the correct terminology used in our current legislation, um, it's not the way that a lot of people identify. Kayla Larson. It's in some cases very regional and cultural differences create different regional ways that we need to change subject headings, as well as within even own communities, like if we look at Masquachis, they have four communities that make up one large community. So there is even going to be possibly a slight cultural difference, language difference, dialect, slang within that community that's specific to them. I think the biggest part of the decolonizing description is not um, finding new words to describe us. Uh, we, we're getting there, but 
building the relationships um, that get us to the point where people are comfortable saying, this is what I call myself, this is who I am. And then we can use that within a better way of describing and organizing uh, knowledge rather than uh, just broad sweeping, these are the Indians of North America and a very colonial perspective. So Kayla, it sounds to me like a big part of the project is about relationship building. And what has uh, the experience of going out to these communities been like? What has the response been? So when we first started the project in the first year that I worked on it, the project definitely was a lot about just kind of trying to hash out those startup issues that happen with projects. And so my big thing was I went out and I asked Indigenous faculty member, Indigenous staff, and Indigenous students what they thought the decolonizing description project was and then how if we were to change specific subject headings how that in turn would affect their research so a lot of the responses were yes subject headings need to be changed they are outdated colonial words there's a lot of racism in subject headings but there were a few individuals who it did not actually bother them but they did understand how it could impact their communities later on if we did change it the The thing that you've pointed at there about the relationships being really important sort of implies that there's a very localized aspect to this process because uh, Indigenous communities are not homogeneous. They're very diverse across Turtle Island, right? So, Sheila, does that add a layer of difficulty? It is a a localized project in that uh, there is only so much we can do here. However, uh, there are different folks um, at different institutions across Canada that are working on this issues like this and projects like this. Learning from each other and not all working in silos to work on this because we're we're working on um, adjusting a system that has been like applied broadly to a diverse group of people. We can't just broadly apply like, okay, this is decolonization. Mm, No, that doesn't, that doesn't work like that. That's not, that's not how that process is. Sheila LaRock, Kayla Larson, you are both young professionals with long careers ahead of you. Why is this work important to you, Kayla? I see this as a great way for reconciliation with communities, as well as reconciliation with a lot of information professionals, because that's kind of an area that's lacking in Canada. If we look at the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, libraries were left out of the section that covers archives and museums. So A lot of people think that they don't have to be accountable to Indigenous people because that, but really they do. For me, this is important as a Indigenous library professional because I work with a lot of students and it is uncomfortable even for me sometimes to say, oh, well, you have to go to E99, which is Indians of North America, when I know that's an outdated term that a lot of people do not use to describe themselves. And especially because E99 has not just First Nations or Native people in it, but it also covers Métis and Inuit who do not necessarily call themselves Indians. As well as I think it allows me to reconcile and give back to communities that supported me throughout the years in just even what could be considered to them a small way, but to a library professional, it's huge. Sheila? I remember trying to do research on my family history and trying to do what I learned in library school and using subject headings and just going down the research rabbit hole of like more and more inappropriate and just not correct uh, ways to describe uh, Métis people and just being very frustrated and also like sad of like literally not seeing myself represented or even acknowledged within these systems. And I know (laughs) that we're out there, but we're just not classified properly. What has been surprising about this work since you started it, Sheila? It surprised me how many other people are thinking in this way and getting to know how many other people have been like putting a lot of like thought and energy into this. Because this problem is such a big and like systemic problem throughout like the library world and like I've heard so many times, ooh, that that's going to be a big problem to solve and yes, I know that, but like <laughs> hearing other people's like this is what I've been thinking about, or like, this is, have you considered this? Has really, like, shown me that, like, okay, yes, this is a big problem, but there are a lot of people who are working on these issues and a diversity of tactics. So that's been actually really great to see. This is Kayla.
I, at first, when they brought me onto this project, didn't know exactly necessarily, other than I was Indigenous, why I was being invited to this project. But then throughout working with other individuals from different units that also sit on this project, I learned that everybody, no matter what your focus is in librarianship, has a purpose within a project like this, because it takes a huge group to run a working group at this size. And especially when it starts moving into more provincial, national, international levels, it takes all different different types of professionals. So Kayla and Sheila, I would like you to imagine a future where the work of reconciliation and decolonization is complete and we have a completely reformed library and archives institution. What does a decolonized library look and feel like? Sheila? Uh, Yeah, so uh, by the time I'm done in June, just kidding. (laughs) So in my one-year contract, uh, no, just kidding. So I think getting to a place where Indigenous knowledge is not separate from Western knowledge, we're not um, compartmentalized within the academy in and of itself. And I think also moving away from book and print-centric library in and not having formats such as oral histories and oral stories be kind of like seen as a special collection because a lot of people don't really relate to that side of librarianship. Also like a space for um, the people who have that knowledge. Like people are not necessarily seen as a format and they aren't, but they still have a place within our library. Having that space alongside the books on our shelves, alongside our archival materials, things like that, I think that is where we'll really get get going towards. Kayla Larson. That's a really tricky question just because libraries are colonial institutions. So when I see, and I mean, it's a very radical view of what a decolonized library would be, I would see the whole institution as almost being gone because a lot of indigenous learning used to be on the land with elders. So I think traditional knowledge would definitely be incorporated. More natural elements and being able to interact with the land would be a library because the land is pretty much a living library. People are living libraries. And I think that's something that we forget about within library institutions when you're just surrounded by books and computers. I think it would be very open, very welcoming, land-based and completely just Nietzsche, which means like a friend in Cree. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, talk with me today. Uh, I really appreciate your work on the project and thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Yeah, thanks for having me anytime. Yeah, thank you, Chris. This is really good. And it's really, it's really good to see that like our voices are being amplified. Yeah, a shout for libraries. So thank you so much. <laughs> That was Shout for Libraries' own Chris Joseph. If you are just tuning in, you are listening to Shout for Libraries, a show about librarians and the issues that matter to them on CJSR. This month, we are diving into the topic of Indigenous stories, storytelling, and libraries. Kendra Cowley sat down for an interview with Lee Skidmore, Indigenous Digital Storytelling Project Facilitator for Voices of Amiskwisi, a digital public space that supports community to create, share, discuss, and collaborate around local Indigenous content. Let's listen in. Do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, your role here at EPL, and the project that you are working on? My name is Lee Skidmore, and I'm a filmmaker and graphic designer. And this year I'm working on the Voices of a Miskwichi project at Edmonton Public Library. And what it is, is it's basically a two-part project where we have created a digital space to house Indigenous content from the Edmonton area. And we've also created workshops to help people learn how to create digital stories And that can mean anything from an actual video to describing photos to showing their showcasing art. There's a lot of different variety of things that they could do on this website. Amazing. So when was this project started? EPL applied for funding last summer and received their grant in November last year. And so there was some preliminary work that they were doing on figuring out what platform they were going to use. They chose a website called Makudu, but they, they had to do a lot of research and they also did did some community consultation in that time and soon after that was done I was hired uh, in April of this year so that's how it started. And what has your role been in the project? My role is called the Indigenous Digital Storytelling Project Facilitator. Okay. That's a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> 
And basically what I've been doing is creating workshops and doing outreach with community groups. And I've also helped with the team. Uh, we have a whole team of people who have worked on the project and we've designed the website and developed it and created the workshops for the public. So is the website up and running currently? And if so, if I were to go there right now, what would I see? How would I engage with the website? So when you go to the website, you'll see our main page, which has a beautiful image that Indigenous visual designers helped us create, as well as our elder who started the project with us and feedback that we got from the consultation. So it's this beautiful image of constellations, which is where a lot of Indigenous creation stories start, and it moves down to the earth where there's water, fire, air, and earth, and all the things that give us life here. And there's a teepee image on the main page that is the place where we share stories. So it is a welcoming place. That's great. How does the site function in terms of who's, who's participating and how they're participating? People can just go on it and view stories that are publicly viewable. So most of the content on the website is intended to be that. Mm -hmm. If a person wants to contribute uh, an Indigenous story, they can sign up and create their own account. And then they'll upload their story, fill in the other content and metadata. And then that story will be approved by the EPL website administrators, just so that there's some safety around um, the internet usage. And the other part of the website is that we can also help community groups and organizations create their own community page. They actually have to access staff from our project team to do that. Then they can curate their own content with a community page they can create their own privacy settings on videos or on different content that they put on the website and they can accept members to their community similar to like a YouTube or a Facebook page uh, in that way. Would that be housed on the main website or is that something that's entirely in the hands of the community? Everybody who signs up with a user account has control of their own content, so okay. they can remove it at any time, and that includes the community groups. Um, so those groups will be able to put on as much content as they want or take it off whenever they feel like, so they have full control. And I know I saw in uh, reading about the website that that was an, an important component mm -hmm. of your commitment to the community was that um, that ownership lied within the community or laid with the community. I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit more and what it means to house this project at EPL, but what it also means to um, have the space for communities to have that ownership over their own um, projects. I think for uh, Indigenous groups who use the website, it's really important that they feel they have ownership of their own content. Historically, institutions have gathered knowledge and it's been somewhat removed from the groups that information came from. I think it's really important that this is a website where communities feel that they have control over um, what is said about them what types of stories they want to share. And are many um, individuals and communities taking advantage of that part of the project? Are they making you know, their own security measures? Are they creating their own online communities through which to share those stories? Well, we just launched the site about a week and a half ago. Okay. So we're still in the process of creating those communities with the groups that have um, shown interest in doing that. So I can't really elaborate on how their privacy settings will work or how they're going to manage the control of their own content. But um, it sounds like most of the organizations want their content to be public. But there could be a few situations where they may want to upload something and have it vet by someone in their community before they release it. Or they may just want to keep something private so that they can share it with just specific people. So that hasn't really been used yet. Yeah, I know uh, something that's come up for me just in the classes that I take in talking um, access to information mm -hmm. and actually talking about um, the Digital North Library, which a couple of my professors are working on. And something they've had to try to figure out is this balance between open access and protocol around who has access to what information and when. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that's a conversation that you've had or is ongoing throughout this project and if you could speak to that a bit. Yeah, every time that we speak with the community group and throughout our consultations before the website was designed, that was a topic that came up quite often. People want to ensure that the traditional ways of 
acquiring knowledge are still relevant and that they're still used. And that knowledge, often traditional knowledge and cultural knowledge is earned. And so that's why there's a, there's some sensitivity around why not just anybody can put any story online whenever they feel like it. You've mentioned um, consultation a lot, and I imagine that was a big part of getting this project up and running because you said it started, the planning stages started when? Um, the consultation started throughout February and March okay. of this year. So what does that process of consultation and collaboration look like? Uh, for this project, the team decided to do collaboration in the community through public meetings. Mm -hmm. And so they informed all sorts of groups, in Indigenous groups in the Edmonton area, and then those groups also informed their clients and people in the public. So there was a wide variety of people that came to these consultations. What we did was we asked them things like, how should the website function? What should it look like? What kind of content do you want to see? What are your concerns? What are some positive outcomes you hope will happen through the project? And how best to deliver programs to Indigenous people? And were there any general themes that came out of that, either surprising or ones that have really been incorporated into the project? I think because this is an urban area, it wasn't surprising to me, but there was a lot of talk about people wanting to learn from elders and really wanting to learn traditional knowledge. It's, it's harder to access elders and knowledge keepers in the city than it is if you lived in a rural community, in an Indigenous community. So... I think for those people that was really important to hear that kind of knowledge. They wanted to make sure that we would reach out to elders and knowledge keepers. So obviously um, ongoing collaboration and consultation is an important part of any sort of creative relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that look like for you as the project continues? Well throughout this project we, we are taking feedback from people every step of the way. So the beginning of the project like I said before it started with like larger groups of community consultation. And now that the site is rolling out, um, as we approach different community groups to talk about how they want to participate in the project, they have some ideas and they help us to develop the site to be more culturally relevant and user-friendly for the people that are going to be using it. And uh, has there been much interest in terms of people wanting to and already like in the process of contributing to the site? Um, there has been a lot of people who have been really excited about the project. Mm -hmm. I think that it's something that people really do want to see is a place where there's a hub of Indigenous knowledge and that it's local and it's about us in this area. So I think it's it's really important. Have people been engaging? Have people been contributing um, or expressing interest right. in contributing? There has been a lot of interest in people contributing to the website. It has been a bit slower than expected. I think with any kind of digital technology that you have to figure out, it takes time to get your resources together and to figure out what things you're going to say about your work and, and that type of stuff. So it's slowly getting more and more stories, but we know a lot of people who, who have committed to putting um, their content on the website. Are there stories up on the site already? What format are they in? Right now, there's a few different formats on the website. There's some video content, and there's also some scanned documents, some historical books, as well as a couple blogs on the website right now. People can upload all sorts of digital media to the website. You could upload a podcast, a sound recording, music, artwork, photographs, or videos. You could also upload a PDF of a poem or writing that you've done. So it doesn't have to be one specific type of story. It can be all sorts of digital stories. Do you have any workshops planned for the future? And, and what will those look like? Um, so right now we, we're having workshops bi-weekly at the Canadian Friendship Centre. Earlier this summer we had um, workshops running through Enterprise Square, APL's branch downtown, and we're planning our future workshop space right now, so um, that was to be determined. And what usually happens at the workshop, or how are they structured? So right now the workshops work where we want to give people hands-on experience to show them that they can do something. So what I've been doing in the most recent workshops is having them create a very short story. It's not their personal story immediately, just to show them that this technology isn't that intimidating, that it's actually quite easy to do with someone guiding you through it. 
it. And from there, they can develop their larger personal story and we can help guide them through that process as well to complete it. So if somebody wanted to find out more about the workshop, uh, where should they look to do that? Go to EPL's website and look at what's on and, and then there's some selections on the side. You can check off Indigenous and you'll see whatever our next workshop coming up would be. In doing my uh, research, I came across um, the mention of an ethical framework and creating a safe and ethical digital space. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about what that means for the site? Sure. So through our consultations with the community, people did say that they wanted to have an ethical and safe space uh, for this website. And what that meant for them was that there would be respect, so like a safe space where people wouldn't be able to comment or um, be a troll on your on your videos or on your content that you contribute to the website. Mm-hmm. That people would have ownership of their own content uh, and they could participate when they chose to or if they didn't want to participate any longer, that they could withdraw. We also did some research on digital storytelling in general and uh, really explored the concept of informed consent and so people really understand what it means to consent when you're sharing online. It's not just checking that I I read the terms and conditions uh, box. It's more about how does it affect you, how does it affect others if you share, and that you really know what it means to share online, like risks that can happen, such as people downloading your work or other types of risks of online sharing. And another part of the ethics that is really important is that people's emotional, physical, mental well-being is first and foremost during the process of digital storytelling and that we at EPL made sure that supports would be in place if people did face any kind of trauma or crisis while doing a digital story. So we did research and made sure to find where those supports are so we could point people in the right direction if that was to happen. So what does that look like in practice, you know, especially talking about consent and uh, wanting to make sure that it's more than just checking off a box? How, how do you go about doing that? We can make sure in our workshops that we can explain informed consent um, mm-hmm. quite in depth, but on the website they do have to read about informed consent and when they upload their videos there is a bo- some boxes you have to check that said that you've read and understand that you're sharing and what that means. So we really hope that people will follow through and read those things and not just check off the box. And in terms of support, so has that meant working with like other community organizations to provide that support or making sure that support is available at the library or as you know something that you've committed to providing through this project? Yeah, we spoke with the support workers at EPL and together we kind of came up with some ideas of how we would deal with finding supports for people that could struggle with something coming out of the storytelling process. And so what we did was we made a list of crisis lines and services that people can access for free that we can tell them about if that's to hap- if that was to happen. Was this in some way connected to Canada 150? Uh, yes, this was. The project itself is funded through the Canada 150 grant. I'm wondering how this project, or how you imagine uh, this project being part of a process of reconciliation, or how you think this can contribute to the conversations at Canada 150. It's been definitely a contentious year uh, for Indigenous people and Canada 150 and I think that people who have gotten behind this project so far was was because they want to leave a legacy of understanding and they want to inform people about who we are and what's currently happening in a truthful and honest way and in our own voice and I think that that's really important for mo- uh, many people. Um, I know that there are people who are resisting anything to do with Canada 150 and I can respect that. Did you want to speak to if you imagine this project could be part of a process of reconciliation or how you see if at all it fitting into that narrative? I think that through stories it creates a space for dialogue and through that dialogue I think reconciliation can start to happen. I think reconciliation means to take actions and to follow through and to change things. So it is really important to listen to the stories that come out of this and I think that's been one of the great things about this project is that there's an opportunity to do that. What sort of stories are you hoping uh, this this site is going to capture? I'm excited to hear about the stories from the youth. I know that there's some in development right now 
and I'm really excited to see what, what their vision of the future is and where they're going to take this country in the future. So. And what have been some of the challenges, expected or not, with this project? Um, a challenge that I've experienced on the project is participation in our workshops. I think that initially the way the storytelling workshops were marketed, it may have been a bit intimidating. People don't often know what a digital story is when you just say digital story. So I think that, you know, we learned over time that we have to be a little more specific, like make a video or learn how to tell a narrative of a photograph or something like that. So there's been some challenges in that way in trying to get people to understand what we mean. And the other part of it, there's two other parts, I think. People are shy and it's hard to talk about your personal life. And the other part is some people just may be intimidated by learning technology as well. So yeah, that has, that has been a challenge. Uh, it's starting to improve, but it definitely started out challenging. <laughs> and so what is EPL doing to reach beyond its community? So to, to make sure that it's not just focusing on those who already use the library. So that's my job and our team's job. We do a lot of outreach where we contact organizations and different groups, educators, a lot of different people throughout the community uh, to spread the word. And it's not just through EPL's channels of like through their website or through their social media. That's a main area, but we are also doing our own work on the ground with community groups. So you said there's going to be a launch. Mm -hmm. Now, is that open to contributors? Is that open to the community? Who, who is invited to this launch? Anybody can come to the launch. They just have to register through the EPL website mm -hmm. on the event, events page. You'll see it under Indigenous Events. Put in your email and how many people will attend, and you can come. Where is it being hosted, and what will it entail? It'll be at the Citadel Theatre on December 6th, and it's from 6.30 to about 8.45. And what we're doing is we're showcasing three digital stories by people that we've worked with. We'll have some entertainment from Indigenous performers. It's going to be hosted by Richard Van Camp. So. Amazing. A mm -hmm. prolific storyteller from yeah. Edmonton. Mm -hmm. That's great. Is there anything else you think we should know about this project? Or anything else you want to share? kind of have a cute story. <laughs> tell us a cute story. Oh, okay. yeah. Please tell us a cute sure. story. So in one of my first workshops um, that I was presenting, there was an elder in the room, and she challenged me to do my own digital story mm -hmm. she asked because I was telling them how to do this story and she just put up her hand and said have you done a story and I'm like and I said no <laughs> so she's like okay <laughs> and she's like I'd like to see your story <laughs> so, um, so I've, I've been working yeah, on that since uh, throughout the project since she said that and yeah, I think it's um, that was a really important thing to hear and for me to do because now I know exactly what I'm asking others to do yeah. by sharing. So when can we expect your story to be up there, and will it be open to the public? Or yeah, my story will be open to the public. It should be online in a couple of weeks. Yeah. I expect it'll be done. It's I wrote it already. I just have to gather all the photos and other pieces of content to go with it. So. Very exciting. Well, I will look out for that. If somebody wanted to check out this project, what's the website? The website is voicesofamiskwichi.ca. Is it accessible through the EPL website? Um, yeah, it is. You can find it through the EPL website as well. Awesome. Great. Right. Well, thank you so much for, for speaking with me. That was Kendra Cowley speaking with Lee Skidmore about the Voices of Amiskwichi project. If you'd like to learn more about this project, we will be posting links to this project on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Shout for Libraries or on Twitter under Shout the number four libraries. We were lucky enough to have Norma Dunning tell us a story in the form of a poem. Norma Dunning is an Inuk writer and scholar. She is a PhD student here at the U of A. Her stories are a compelling mix of raw honesty and warm humor. And she has a book out. Annie McTuck and Other Stories is published by the University of Alberta Press and is available where you buy your books or at the library. But you should buy it. Hello, good morning. This is Norma Dunning. I'm the author of Annie McTuck and Other Stories. However, I do uh, write a great deal of poetry. And it was always my very first first form of storytelling. 
And the poem I would like to share with you and whoever listens to this is called You Never Went to Hell on Venials. It is, uh, the title is taken from Anthony Packard Thrasher's uh, autobiography called um, Skid Row Eskimo. And it's a poem that I've had with me for a very long time, but I've only ever read it publicly. So uh, I chose this because there are Inuit people who live here in Edmonton, and we, we are small and a very quiet population. And um, I wanted to be able to uh, share a part of his story. And he was someone who left his footprints here. And so here, here it goes. It's called, You Never Went to Hell on Venials. A hard life lived, starting as a babe in the Northwest Territories. A simple life then, of hunting and trapping and running and running and running away from residential school. Had to be there for his dad to get the government checks based on the boy's school official records. But the land lured him, trapped him instead and called his name over and over and over again until he ran and lived, young and alone but free and happy on a barren flatscape at 12 years old. Adventure beckoned. Go to Alberta, make money, party, and live the stoned high life, arriving by plane to work the rigs, knowing the government man is going to teach you to drive and take care of big machines. You'll get a trade. Really be someone when you get back to Tuck. King of the road, 19 years old. Tried for murder, ya lousy, homeless, drunk. All you natives, you're all the same anyways, eh? Really, why can't y'all just smarten up and get over it for God's sake? I didn't put you in that straight jacket or that fucking institution. Homeless? My ass. It's your choice. You like having endless blurred nights on Edmonton streets, sucking back cherry wine, rocking those rich old in the back seats of their Cadillacs. Anthony Packard Thrasher died in a parking lot in downtown Edmonton in July of 1989. The title for this poem is taken from chapter one of his autobiography, Skid Row, Eskimo. What an amazing poem. If you enjoyed it, be sure to check out Norma Dunning's new book, Annie Muktuk and Other Stories. Don't forget that libraries also carry items recorded on visual mediums. In fact, Indigenous storytelling recently hit the big screens in the movie Thor Ragnarok. Hey, Michelle, didn't you go and see that? Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I did, Larissa. I'm here with the show for Library's interview of Thor Ragnarok. But, Michelle, today's program is about Indigenous storytelling. Why would you be reviewing a big-budget Marvel movie loosely based on Norse mythology? Aside from everything that is factually wrong, forcing mythological characters who regularly get into slapstick messes to play out King Lear in space seemed like a weird decision to me. I'll tell you why I'm reviewing this today. Taika Waititi. The Maori director of the hilarious faux documentary What We Do in the Shadows also directed this movie, and as a result, it has some very indigenous themes. The night after I watched this movie, I was staring at the ceiling on my way to sleep, still snort-giggling half of the script to myself, when I suddenly was struck by a question. Was the entire A plot of this movie about the way that many modern first world countries lie about the violent ways in which they originally acquired power in order to project legitimacy? In short, the answer was yes. What I didn't realize, however, was the way that the character of Valkyrie was crafted to be an indigenous character resisting colonization. With Maori-style tattoos and face paint inspired by the traditions of the Australian Yagumba mob on whose land the film was shot, Valkyrie begins the movie having had her identity taken from her, and this is symbolized by the fact that she's referred to by number rather than name. 
At this point in the movie, she has given up on living as her true self and struggles with alcoholism as a result of past trauma. She is displaced from her homeland and lives on a prison planet working for a slaver who is offended by the word slave, insisting on the phrase prisoners with jobs. The movie also makes very deliberate use of color. Valkyrie's initial ship is painted the colors of the Tino Rangiti Rotanga flag, a flag designed by the Maori to represent their own sovereignty. Later, the ship she uses to eventually leave the planet and return to her home displays the colors of the Australian Aboriginal people. For more on the indigenous symbolism of Thor Ragnarok, you can check out Endless Yarning's article, Thor Ragnarok, A Very Indigenous Film. We'll post a link on our Facebook page. Why else should you see the new Thor? It's fun, it's got heart, and it's ungodly funny. Ha, <laughs> <laughs> get it? <laughs> because, you, well, it's funnier than me. That was a great recommendation from Michelle Terrace. If you are just tuning in, welcome to Shout for Libraries on CJSR. And that's it for today's show. Thanks to our guests and all of our contributors. A special thanks to Anu Perihan, a.k.a. Anoop Scoop, who composed our theme music. We hope you enjoyed our exploration of Indigenous storytelling. We'd love to hear your thoughts, too. You can find us on Facebook at shout for libraries or on Twitter under the Shout, the number four, Libraries. Once again, this has been Michelle. And Larissa. And Marin. And we have been your hosts for this half hour of Library-Centric Radio. Catch us on the next episode of Shout for Libraries. Mm-hmm.